So today we're concluding a, a rather large section of the book of Hebrews uh, that we've been looking at, about 26 verses in total, started all the way back in chapter 3 at verse 7, and all of it deals with the rest of God. And, and when we mean rest, not the, the more of God, but the rest that God gives us, right? And remember to whom this letter was written. This was a congregation of Jewish Christians who were living around Rome at the time. Some think the letter was written about 63 AD. And they were facing persecution. In fact, they had already experienced persecution. Uh, their, all of their possessions had been confiscated. Uh, at a certain point, they were ran out of the area, but then they were allowed to come back. But soon, we know in church history that the emperor Nero would be coming to power and even more persecution was about to be poured out upon these Christians there. And the book of Hebrews was written to encourage them, to admonish them, and yes, even to warn them that they're going to need to hold on to their courage. Christianity's not for wimps. There was a pressure on them. There was a pressure on them to walk away from Christ. And sometimes, sadly, we've seen that throughout church history. When it gets going rough, when things start to happen, people look away from the Lord. And so today, that's what we're considering today. I want to encourage you. I want to admonish you. And yes, I'm going to warn you today. There's consequences for forsaking the Lord, and that's what we've been looking at, and that's what this passage has been dwelt on. Uh, dwelling on extensively for these last 26 verses. So let's pick up then again our sermon here with uh, the call to urgently enter God's rest. Urgently enter God's rest. Notice verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Now, this is not unusual. This is the normal Christian life. We are called to diligence, to faithfulness. Notice that word diligent is from the Greek word spude, which means to speed. Some translations say to, to hasten after or to be eager for, or in my paraphrase, it's to be zealous. So literally, let us strive, therefore, to enter that rest. Now, I don't know if that kind of sounds strange, right? we got to strive to rest, and yet that's what is before us, and that is the Christian life. And, and it, it requires the greatest exertion from us that we might remain in Christ. Now, remember, we do not strive to become a Christian. We do not work our way into heaven. We're not trying to score points to have our good works outweigh our bad works so that we could be a Christian. Eternal life and forgiveness and inward transformation is a gift. It's what God does for you, and it's what God does in you. And so by faith, when we come to Christ, we do. We enter into rest. There is a true rest for our souls. And it's not just when we die. There's a true spiritual rest. A true spiritual peace that comes to us as Christians. But, as we see in our text, we have to zealously cling to Him. Unless, because of pressure or temptation, we fall away. So, spiritual zeal, in my experience is absolutely related to the overflow or lack thereof of an ongoing relationship with Jesus. We love Him because He first loved us. And that should capture our heart and cause us to love Him with all of our heart. And we out of gratitude for that gift that He gave us. He gave us the gift of salvation. He gave us rest for our soul. It's out of that gratitude that we fervently 
live out our life of faith. We get to run our life for Christ. We get to. And we do it not in the flesh, not in our own effort, not by gritting our teeth, but by humble reliance on the indwelling Holy Spirit that He has given us. And we are most alive when we realize God's pleasure as we run hard after Him with all of our hearts. That's what it says. We are to run. We are to make haste. We are to pursue with all of our heart. And of course, if you know the book of Hebrews, it's anticipating what he's going to come back to in Hebrews 12. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to who? To Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So Christ, in His mercy, has set you on His race. Otherwise, had He not done that, we would be aimless. We would be like the sheep that have gone astray, the Bible talks about. We'll be like the oxen that's being led off to the slaughter that the Bible talks about. See, you did not put yourself on the highway to heaven. Jesus is the author of your faith. And that's good. <laughs> because if you had to save yourself, there's no hope. But Christ saves us. And therefore, He gets all of the glory. We don't get to pat ourselves on the back for our faith. It's something that God has done for us by His grace. So, we need to examine our hearts, even as Christians. Have we lapsed into self-righteousness? Are we looking to ourselves? Are we looking to our own good works? Are we looking to our religious deeds? Oh, I show up at church, I punch, I punch the clock, I've done my duty. Or do we know Him? Are you only trusting in Jesus? Only in what God had done for you in your Son? Jesus we're told here in this passage is He's not only the beginner of our faith and the author of it and, and the architect who started our faith, He's also the one who is the completion. He's the finisher. He is the goal of our faith. So let me ask, are you fervently persisting in your Christian race as you run towards your Christ? Because that's what we have to look forward to. Now these poor suffering Christians were being confronted. To stay faithful to Jesus, they were going to have to suffer some short-term loss. But was it worth it? They professed a faith in Christ and it was being tested. Would they profess Christ even to the end, even if they suffered for Him? That's why we're admonished later in Hebrews 12, remember this, Consider Christ, who endured such hostility from sinners against Himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. If there's anything we're good at, we're good at feeling sorry for ourselves. It comes pretty naturally. And so what is a Christian to do when we're tempted to self-pity? We're to remember the price that Jesus paid, that He willingly paid on the cross when He laid down His life for you, suffering in His body the wrath of God for your sin. Remember that when you're struggling. Lift up your eyes. Don't look at yourself. We're not comparing ourselves. We're looking to Jesus. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We get focused on Him. We didn't get focused on other preachers who will fail you, other Christians who will let you down. We fix our eyes on Jesus and we run to Him. Are you? Will you? Some of you know the story of Eric Little. Eric Little was a famous missionary to China in the 1920s. Uh, he was a very accomplished athlete. 
uh, from Scotland. And of course, he became very famous because he was called to go to the Olympic Games in 1924. And uh, his best event was the 100 meter uh, dash. And he was favored to win it. Only we know the problem. They scheduled it on the Lord's Day. And he was a Sabbath keeper. And he said, well, I guess I won't be competing in the 100 uh, meter dash. And would not receive the gold medal and Olympic glory. Now, God did provide, and he did run another race, the 400 meter. And he did win that race. But little saw his running as a great metaphor and is also as a great opportunity to be able to share the gospel whenever he could. And he would compare his running to the most important race, that is the race of faith. And this is what Eric Little said. Where does the power come from to see the race of faith to its end? From within. Jesus said, Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. If with all your hearts you truly seek me, you shall surely find me. So if you commit yourself to the love of Christ, then that is how you will run a straight race. What do we know of Little? Little returned uh, after the Olympics back to China. And he served there another 20 years, and finished his race in China at age 43, dying in a Japanese, uh, World War II Japanese internment camp. And he stayed faithful to the Lord. If you have not seen the movie, you need to get the movie Chariots of Fire. Show it to your kids. Let them see what faithfulness and running your race to the end looks like. That's why Paul warned the Corinthians, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Are you? So today I'm asking that God would grant you His persevering grace, that you will remain faithful to Christ no matter how hard the race is, no matter how strong the persecution is, or no matter how high the cost. Never Forsake Him who promised He will never forsake you. Amen? Lest in falling away, we succumb to the same example of disobedience. We'll return to that. Now we go on to verse 12. And we want to discuss God's invincible word. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Notice the, uh, the verse begins with four. It's a conjunction. It's bringing these two thoughts together. Verse 11 and verse 12 are connected. And 4 is answering the question, why? Why should I make haste? Why should I stay zealous? Why must I remain faithful to Christ? And as we've seen through this passage, the Holy Spirit is applying that very important story in Israel's uh, history where Israel rebelled against God in the wilderness. Now remember, going all the way back to Abraham, 400 years before they came out of Egypt and out of slavery, God had made a promise to Abraham and that his descendants would possess the land of Canaan. We see that in Genesis 12. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. God repeated that promise to Israel. And so here they were on the cusp of realizing the promise of God. It took hundreds of years for it to come to pass, but when they got right to the edge of the promised land, they sent in the 12 spies. Ten of them came back and said, there's no way. There's no way we can possess the land. Yes, 
It's a great land. It's flowing with milk and honey. Great blessing is there, but there's giants. There's Goliaths. And we are like grasshoppers in their sight. But God had already given them the promise. And they failed to believe it. And that's a little bit shocking when you think about it. And what do we know about God? Well, we know this. God delights in taking weak things and use them to confound and defeat the strong. Why? (laughs) That way He gets the glory, right? And we see that all through Scripture. And remember, these Israelites had just come out of Egypt. Egypt was the superpower of the day. And God crushed Egypt and delivered them out of Egyptian slavery. How much more easy would it be for God to crush these petty little Canaanites. And yet, they could not believe the promise of God. And they did not believe the good news that was preached to them by Caleb and Joshua. What was the good news? If the Lord delights in us, then He will bring us into the land. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for the Lord is with us. He's with us in Christ. But because that generation decided, no, God can't help us, all of them died in the wilderness. That's the story that you need to keep in the back of your mind. And what do we know then about God? And this is a warning to us. God is serious about the penalties that He declares in His Word against unbelief. Do you believe them? It is in this context then that we're being reminded of the grave danger that we are in if we succumb to spiritual insanity and refuse to follow Christ and refuse to rely on His grace. So verse 12 says, For the Word of God is living and powerful. The Word is compared to many things. uh, And we like some of those comparisons. The Word's compared to a seed sometimes. Uh, The Word is compared to a light uh, for our path. Uh, Psalms even says it's like honey on our lips. We know the Word of God is wisdom for our mind and it's life for our soul. But the emphasis here is on living. If you look at the Greek text, that's the first word. Living! is the Word of God. Now we know Jesus affirmed that. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So yes, the Word of God is living. But let me just tell you, Bible students, when God calls Himself the living God, usually that's because He is contrasting Himself with the the idols of the pagans. He is the true and the living God compared to the other religions, the other idols that the pagans were worshiping. And Jesus even says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of who? The living God. This is serious language. The Bible is living and that should humble us. Because the Scriptures are the Word of God, they are alive with its own inherent power. That's why we see in Isaiah 55, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. So whatever you take away from this sermon today, please hear me. Please do not have a careless attitude towards the Word of God. When you hear it, you better believe it. You better submit to it. That generation that heard it didn't, and they died. That's what's being presented to us. Don't be like them. 
Hear the word of God. Receive the word of God. It is alive and it is powerful. And when it comes, it comes with all the authority of God. And we see here an image of judgment. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. What do you see in your imagination? (laughs) I see the Lord coming, swinging His sword. And it's a two-edged sword, sharper than any human sword. And it's a piercing sword. It divides anything that it touches. When the Word of God comes, it comes in all of its power and invincible authority. So the Word of God is sharp and slashing. It's piercing power, unstoppable, and it is all-inclusive. Nothing can hide from the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So, soul and spirit, joint and marrow, all of it succumbs. The Word of God is not some dead letter. It's not some unenforced law. When we hear the Word of God and we do not believe it, it will not go well for us because it's alive. And we saw a generation perished as a result. That's why elsewhere in the Scripture we read, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that smashes a rock? I hear your objection out there. It's getting quiet in here. Well, that was all Old Testament, preacher. Certainly we don't need to be afraid like the Israelites. Okay, well, let's see. How does Jesus then, gentle Jesus, pastor his church? Well, we have a glimpse of that, don't we, in the book of Revelation, in the opening chapters here, when these letters are written from Jesus to these churches. And let's hear what Christ said to the church in Pergamos, who decided compromising with the culture was was okay. We're going to contextualize, to use the modern term. Listen to what Jesus had to say. I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, meaning to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and I will fight against them, how? With the sword of my mouth. You see the imagery there? The sword of the Spirit resides in the mouth of your king. If you read the opening chapter of the book of Revelation, in Revelation 1, you'll see this beautiful image of Christ, and there Christ is standing among uh, the stars which represent the, uh, the church and the, and the candlestick. And what do we see? Jesus is portrayed there with the sword coming out of his mouth. This is the nature of of God. It's the nature of our Christ. When he re- we see Him portrayed in Revelation 19, when He's coming back in all of His glory, what do we see? The sword of the Word of God coming out of His mouth. He uses His Word to bring life and to bring judgment. They needed to be reminded of this. So what do we know? All the promises and threatenings of God. All His promised blessings and all of His covenant curses can not be broken. That's what the Lord says. The unbelief of Israel excluded them from Canaan and they died in the wilderness. And if we deny Christ, we will die outside of heaven. We will endure the torments of hell. The Word of the Lord. What else do we know about God's Word? And God's Word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Oh, church, God sees us. He sees us in all of our hypocrisies. 
in all of our lives, even if they're just in our heart. See, God knows our very thoughts and feelings, even our opinions and our desires. That's why people don't want to talk to us at the mall yesterday. Do you consider yourself a good person? Oh, I'm fine. (laughs) Are you? Are you a good person? See, we know in our heart too much. Even our conscience knows the truth. There is a holy God and we are subject to His holy justice. That's why the Bible commands you that you must keep your heart with all diligence. Young people, keep your heart. Protect your heart with all diligence. Why? Because ultimately, everything in your life flows from your heart. And when you're stuck in your sin, you have to admit, it's because you love your sin more than you love God. I wish it was more complicated. But it's not. So let's conclude then, thirdly, your total exposure. Verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. We don't like to hear this in the church. Everybody wants to hear about blessings and prosperity. And fine, I want you to be blessed. I hope you're prospered. But you better not forget this. That you will one day account for yourselves before the judgment seat of Christ. And, as we know, there's no such thing as a secret sin. Be sure, the Scripture tells us, your sins will be found out. So, Man is helplessly and thoroughly exposed to God. And we all know it. In fact, Jesus said this of Himself, again in relationship to the church in Revelation 2, I am He who searches the minds and the hearts. And I pray that God is doing that here today. That God is searching us. But we're all like our fallen parents. When Adam and Eve were caught in their sin, what did they do? They, the big cover-up, right? They tried to get some fig leaves, and then when that didn't work, they started blaming each other, right? It's this woman. It's this devil. We're very good at trying to cover up. We're very good at trying to blame shift. That's easy. That's what we do by nature. What we're called to do as Christians is to own the truth and humbly come before our God and confess our sins. God knows fully and truly who we are. He knows our pride, our false professions, our half-hearted, insincere repentance, and even those who think that they're converted but have false conversions. And even if we have a powerful ministry, even if you cast out demons and and do all sorts of dramatic things in the name of Jesus, Jesus said this, that on that day He will say to you, depart from Me, you workers of iniquity. Why? I never knew you. Do you know Him? Are you in a relationship with Him? Have you received His grace and mercy? So as we conclude today, I pray that as we've opened the Scriptures, and that's what happens here today, by the way, but it happens every Sunday, and that's why you need to be here. Because we need to come under the authority of this book. Because when we're here, things happen. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's saying to you. It's not none of my business. It's between you and the Lord. But I know the Holy Spirit speaks because we're here gathered in His name and we're here under His authority. And the Lord meets us here. That's why you need to be in church every Sunday because we will wander. We will will follow our own feelings, our own emotions, and we've got to come here and allow God's Word to wash us and to cleanse us and to drive us to this table, to drive us to Christ and to remind us that we are saved by Christ and we must pursue Christ. We must be zealously committed to Christ. That's why we come here every Sunday to recommit our lives and renew our covenant with God. 
So handle this book, dear ones, with care, but handle it. You need to be in it every day. And let it do its work. Let us do its piercing. Let us do its hacking. Let the Word of God work on our soul. God does it for our good. So, dear ones, this morning, if you're wavering in your faith and you're struggling to hold on to Christ, I'm glad you're here. Would you, with me, cry out, O oh Lord, help me in my unbelief. That's a, that's a legitimate prayer. Lord, I'm struggling to believe. Lord, I'm struggling to hold on. Lord, help me in my unbelief. And God will hear that prayer. No matter how discouraged you might be, God will be faithful to you. So let me ask you this morning before we close, have you submitted to Christ? Have you submitted to His authority? Have you asked Him for forgiveness like Ivy and Quentin did and what we're going to be celebrating here today? The good news is, if you will come to Christ, even though He knows the truth about you, He knows you better than you know yourself, He offers you His mercy and His grace today. Have you? Will you flee to Christ and find His mercies today? Let's pray.